Hi, Felice Shapiro here with Better After 50. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Claudia Levine and Kate McLaughlin, co-founders of Menopause Jewel Box. And we're going to really learn a lot today about an interesting topic regarding our changing bodies after menopause and specifically how it affects UTIs, recurring UTIs, prevention, what to do with it, because it's the game's a lot different after menopause. Um, so Claudia, why don't you start and tell us a little bit about where we're going today with this talk? Sure. Well, thank you for having us. Nice to see you again, Felice. So we're going to talk a little bit about sort of how our bodies change. So what happens in a lower estrogen state after menopause and how that impacts the sort of architecture of our, the tissue of our body and how that can lead to UTIs in a way that's different than we experience UTIs in our 20s and 30s because things do change and that definitely has an impact on urinary tract infections as we get older. So Kate's gonna start us off by talking about how our bodies change and how that may set us up for UTIs in a different way. Great. So thanks again for having us, please. So I am a family nurse practitioner and I specialize in sexual reproductive health. And we wanna talk about um, our, our vulvas and our vaginas and all of the skin that is very tender. Um, and, and important. So as we, as we pass through menopause and our estrogen levels in our bodies go down overall, that tissue is particularly affected because we have lots of receptors for hormones in the vulva, the vulvar skin, which is the outside part of the genitals, the um, vagina, which is the inside part of our genitals and around the urethra, which is where the urine comes out of our bodies and all, and also including that we also have receptors in the muscles and our pelvic floor. Um, so it, it's really, it's, it's a really estrogen receptor rich area. As we have lower levels of estrogen, the tissue that is it that is in our vulvas and vaginas can become thinner, can be, it becomes less elastic. And so it can become more fragile. And the way people often experience is that experience this is that they may feel some, they may feel burning, they may feel itching, they may um, experience more dryness, discomfort with sex, pain with sex. Um, but some people are so sensitive, they may even have discomfort when they're wearing jeans. Um, one, one reason it's so important to bring this topic up is because about 80% of people will experience some symptoms and a tiny fraction of those people actually ever talk to their healthcare providers about it. And many, oftentimes healthcare providers aren't great at asking about it. So that's why it's so important to talk about it. So as we have these, these um, as these tissues change, some of the other things that happen is that the microbiome, which is sort of the flora and fauna of our vagina, so all of the different bacteria and yeasts that normally live in our vagina, shifts significantly. Um, so from a it used to be more acidic when we're in our reproductive years, it tends to be more acidic. And there are specific um, bacteria like lactobacilli that live there that produce the acid. And then it becomes more basic. And so some people may notice a change in the odor, change in lubrication. Um, and that can also set us up for di a diff different sensations in, in, our, in our vagina and vulva. And we also may notice different sensations around that have to do with our pelvic floor muscles. They may not be um, as strong and toned as they used to be. And this can influence things like incontinence, le urinary leakage, urgency, like having to go really bad with it right now, not, no time to wait. Um, and also can experience, it can impact how we experience sex. So those, those are some of the things that happen. Um, and we really wanna stress that there is something that you can do for all of these things. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but there's something you can do, talk to your healthcare provider about it. And there are a variety of things that can be causing symptoms in your vulva and vagina. And so an exam and talking to your healthcare provider are always very important. Um, but if, yeah, yeah, that is real, that's fantastic. So I think for a lot of women um, who have had OBGYNs and are looking for new um, practitioners, doctors to work with um, post-menopause or during menopause, really important to um, take, listen to what you're saying here, because 
in the interview process, if that's not a topic they, they can really handle in a current way, which hopefully they can, um, move along and uh, find <laughs> somebody else, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so moving into urinary tract infections, which can definitely become an issue. And again, in a different way than when we're in our 20s and 30s. But in this low estrogen state, when tissues change, and like Kate just said, this sort of shift in this really kind of healthy lactobacilli, which keeps things nice and happy and healthy, when that shifts, it can actually make us more susceptible to urinary tract infections. So basically, most urinary tract infections are coming from our um, digestive system. So like when we go to the bathroom and we poop and that our, our bottom or our anus is pretty close to our urethra. So if we like feel our bodies or just understand our anatomy, our anus is right next to our urethra and our vagina. So that skin can get colonized or sort of the bacteria from our poop can hang out there. And then if that bacteria has a chance to get into the urethra or the the hole that we pee out of, then that bacteria can kind of cause infection in the urethra and also in the bladder. So the urethra and the bladder are connected. So when you have an infection in either the bladder or the urethra, that's called uncomplicated cystitis or a lower urinary tract infection, meaning it's not getting up into our kidneys. And that's pretty common both when we're younger and also as we get older, but somewhat different reasons guide that. And again, as our bodies change and the anatomy changes and the protective lactobacilli changes, those infections can become more common and sometimes they can become recurrent. So when we say recurrent, we mean if we're having more than two infections in a six month period of time or more than three in a year. So if we have them sporadically less often than that, then they're not considered to be recurrent. The things that we know put us at risk for urinary tract infections the first is any kind of penetrative sex. So that movement of that bacteria from outside of the urethra with sex kind of can move it up into the urethra, into the bladder. So that's a risk. Having a new sexual partner is also a risk. So if you're kind of in a new sexual relationship, you may notice after starting to have sex with a new partner that you have a urinary tract infection that you haven't had in a while. So those are two things that can increase our risk. Another is just the genetics of how the bacteria that hangs out in that area of our body can stick to sort of the lining of the urethra and the bladder. And there is a genetic predisposition that some of us have for like stickier um, bacteria that can then cause infection more readily than someone who doesn't have that stickiness. And incontinence or urinary leakage is another risk factor for um, urinary tract infections as we get older. So if we are leaking urine, again, often it happens when the estrogen rich sort of tissue and particularly the pelvic floor muscles become a little bit less supportive than parts of our body like our bladder and our, and our urethra and our vagina can kind of move out of place and that can also increase our risk for having a urinary tract infection. So that's all kind of the risk realm. And then there's the sort of really important point that not all burning with urination is an infection. And that's a super important point because I think, you know, Kate and I in our clinical practice, we get calls and visits all the time. I'm burning, send me a urinary, send me an antibiotic. And sometimes that's totally appropriate because sometimes you do have an infection and you need an antibiotic. But there are other times when you have burning and it's not a urinary tract infection. So a really important point would be get a urine culture when you have the burning. And something I do in my practice and I know Kate does too is we'll put a standing order in. So if you're someone who's prone to urinary tract infections or concerned about it or you just had one, I'll just send an extra order to the lab for you so that if you have the burning again, you can just go get your urine checked. And we get those results back usually within a day or two and we can tell you, yep, you need another antibiotic or actually it doesn't look like an infection. So let's figure out what's causing the burning. That's not an infection. And that's really important to save you unnecessary antibiotics. And also to figure out like, if it's not a urinary tract infection, then we wanna know why are you having burning with urination? So that's a really easy thing to do and advocate for with your provider. Just ask for a standing urine 
you know, you're in order so that that can get checked out right away. Um, Claudia, just um, there's a lot of over the counter uh, ways to test for UTIs. Uh, and I think a lot of people just do that. And yeah, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, you're saying call your provider. So yeah. So one of the problems with those tests is that they're not going to do what's they're not going to do a culture in the sense of looking at what the bug is and what antibiotics might be sensitive to treat that infection. So that's the downside. So those tests are not as good at both telling you whether it's a urinary tract infection or not, because there are a fair number of false positives, meaning the test is positive, but you don't actually have an infection. And then it's not going the next step at guiding you towards the right choice of treatment. And especially for someone who has recurrent urinary tract infections, that's really important. That extra information is super useful and needed in order to guide the best treatment course. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, this, this is incredibly um, informative in terms of just the different degrees of the UTIs and how things shift over time, um, for sure. So when you talk about the changing anatomy, all right, so we, we understand the UTIs and the, and, the, and the treatments, call your practitioner, right? This yeah. Is, this yeah. Is, um, but this is a good understanding of why it happens and how to, um, well, not, we haven't really gotten to the how-to. So now we're like, at that point where we have them, they're, they're either recurrent, we get them, we need to understand what they are, but what can we do um, besides not have sex or- No, do not not have sex, that's not the answer. <laughs> or, okay, good. Or how about, you know, just kind of being cleaner and all of that. Is there something estrogen wise that people can do that are beyond what you've just discussed? So estrogen, both systemic, but especially topical. So systemic meaning it's a patch or sometimes a pill that you take, it circulates throughout your whole entire body. And people often use that to treat hot flashes is the main indication, but it can impact mood and can back bone, it can impact bone health. Some people, and that is what people typically know as hormone therapy. Um, and that can improve symptoms. However, some people who are on hormone therapy still need additional treatment. And also there are many people who either don't want hormone therapy, don't need hormone therapy, or it is not an option for them because of other health problems that they have. And so a really fantastic treatment for everyone who falls into that category is topical estrogen. So topical estrogen is um, estrogen that is applied to the vulva vaginal region. Typically it goes inside your vagina. There are tablets, there are creams. There are also um, soft plastic rings that the ring itself is it's physical. Um, the it's not doing anything mechanically. It is transmitting the medication, the same medication through the skin, which we call transdermal. And um, all of what all of those do is they can help reverse, um, not completely, but in a large degree, a lot of those changes I described earlier in our conversation. So they um, they activate those those estrogen receptors. They can bring they plump up the tissues a little. They make them more elastic. So that can really help with some of that vulnerability we talked about that Claudia was talking about to urinary tract infections. So they can they they essentially. Um, and they can also change the P, they also change the pH and the bacteria that are in the vagina. So they provide sort of multiple layers of, of protection from the movement of that bacteria. Like if it does get in there, which it does for most people, and just some of us are more prone to, um, some of us are, are more prone to those UTIs than others. So we can do all of these things to protect them. And I do want to say that like having a urinary tract infection is really not about cleanliness. I mean, it is, you know, general high, normal general hygiene is enough. You don't need to be cleaning your vagina in a special way or, you know, your, or your anus in a special way. You just need to rinse in the shower. Um, and with, and with just water for your vulva is enough, um, for most people, especially if someone has sensitive skin or is having any vulva or vaginal issues, we really, we really, really advise against using um, soap or any other products, douching, any of those things. So just want to emphasize, this is not a cleanliness issue. It's really a, a yeah, biological yeah. change issue. Um, just a question on that. Um, so I don't really hear any downside of 
just prevent just in general taking using the creams tablets or ring um, because you just talked about a lot of benefits and I didn't hear anything negative that you said um, including people have thinning walls thin skin and um, which we can talk about next time in our next conversation because I um, this is this is a, a tremendous amount of information but um, is there any downside so for topical estrogen, almost none. The caveat to that is, a, is someone who's experienced breast cancer, we always encourage a conversation with their oncologist. Either we'll have it with the oncologist or the person can have it with the oncologist just to make sure there's nothing specific about their breast cancer where that would be not recommended. But in general, almost everybody can use a topical locally acting estrogen. And in addition to estrogen, Moisturizers are also recommended. So there are a lot of moisturizers out on you know, the market that are probably coming in your Instagram feed right now and telling you by me. Um, the two that Kate and I recommend the most because of their general kind of ingredients and the companies that, that make them and the way in which they create their products are Good Clean Love and IS. I know Felicia can link to that, but those are two moisturizers. And a moisturizer is something that you're using outside of sex on a regular basis, like either every day or a couple times a week. And that's also working with the estrogen to really help just really kind of nurture all of the tissue that we're talking about and create the most both soothing and, and comfortable environment for us in our daily lives and our bodies, but also the tissue itself. So those two things together, a, a topical estrogen and or a moisturizer. And some people don't wanna use estrogen, but moisturizers can work really well too. And um, just one more thing, the topical estrogen is only through your provider, right? You can't get anything. You over. cannot currently get it in the United States without a prescription. Yeah. Oh, just, and, but you can in other countries. You can. <laughs> and, I Another think, thing to bring back from Paris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just to be uh, Claudia and I do not have any financial affiliation with those two products. We recommend them because they are awesome and they have been really thoughtful about the way they're formulated to support the, the vaginal environment. Um, and another thing about, you know, there isn't a, a huge downside to estrogen also, but not everyone needs it. And so if someone is like, my, everything feels fine. Like I feel great. You don't have to, it's not something you need to do. Um, oh, and, actively. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Like if you're, but if you're having symptoms, you should definitely consider it um, and definitely talk to your healthcare provider and investigate what's going on. But also again, not all of the symptoms a person has after menopause are necessarily related to those estrogen changes. There can be a number of other issues that require treatment and that should be evaluated by someone who does it a lot. Okay. Well, this, this has been a lot of information and probably more than most of us knew before we, before we heard what you had to say. So that's terrific. And um, I'd like to continue this dialogue and we will have another, um, session so that uh, BA 50s can continue to learn as our bodies change because Lord knows we are well aware that they are changing. They are changing. Yes. So thank <laughs> you so much, Claudia and Kate. Thank you. For really sure. giving us all this current information and uh, we will put the links in and we'll see and meet up again soon. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you.